What is happening, everybody? Welcome in to an all-new episode of the Pack-A-Day Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on X at Andy Herman NFL. I think we have a nice, easy, breezy Sunday episode for you today. What I'm actually excited about, I love doing these every single season. Every once in a while, we get some bold takes, right? Some of these maybe aren't quite as bold, but we are going to be going over 12 bold predictions for the Packers 2024 offseason there is a lot of stuff that can still happen. There can be releases that we are expecting or maybe not expecting, re-signings, players who walk in free agency. The Packers may be making a splash or two in free agency. We've got the draft. We've got a major deal upcoming for Jordan Love. So I'm going to go in a variety of different directions with my 12 bold predictions for this episode. I'm excited to jump into it right away. I always say like, I think today's going to be like a shorter episode and then it ends up going 45 minutes anyway. But I think today, will be a nice, fun, easy episode. So let's jump into it right away. Number one on my list for my 12 bold predictions for the Packers offseason. Number one, the Packers will add four, four safeties via free agency in the draft this offseason. I think this will be a complete overhaul of the safety room. I am making my bold prediction that the Packers will not bring back Jonathan Owens, they will not bring back Rudy Ford. They will not bring back Darnell Savage. Currently, the three safeties that have actually spent any real time on the team, Anthony Johnson Jr., Benny Sapp III, and Zane Anderson. Those are the only three. And I think ideally you would like those three fighting for the fifth and maybe a sixth roster spot if they deem it necessary based on special teams prowess. I don't think those three are really going to be in the conversation for at all for maybe one of those top four safety spots if Anthony Johnson Jr., one of those guys get in it, great, awesome, that's a bonus. But I think they are going to nuke this safety room basically and completely build it from scratch. I think you're probably going to see a couple free agent additions at that position. I think you're going to see at least a couple draft picks. And I also believe you will see some undrafted free agents added at that position as well. A whole new group of players. We know for a fact that when Brian Gutekunst senses a weakness at a specific position, he often buys in bulk. He's done it at running back in the past. He did it at edge rusher with Preston Zedarius and Rashawn Gary. He did it at safety with Darnell Savage and Adrian Amos. When he notices an issue, he is not will, you know, he's he's not unwilling to go out and spend aggressively using the resources that he has via, via both free agency and the draft to address that situation. And I think he's going to look dead at that safety room and recognize, yeah, we need a major overhaul. I kind of like what he did last year. He basically used the same approach last year. He just, one, it was a really weak safety class in the draft. And I know this one isn't great either, but it was really weak a season ago. And then number two, he didn't have any money to spend. So he basically did the exact same thing Uh, Darnell Savage, remember, was on a guaranteed contract. Even if they released him, they would have had to pay him everything anyway. But they basically, they bring back Rudy Ford on a vet, basically a, a slightly larger vet minimum deal. Dallin Levitt brought back on a slightly larger vet minimum deal. Jonathan Owens on a slightly over vet minimum deal. And then Tarvarius Moore on a slightly over vet minimum deal. And then they go and get Anthony Johnson Jr. as a seventh round pick and Benny Sapp as an undrafted free agent. And then Zane Anderson, they pick up through the course of the season via waivers. So they use that same approach. It just was the bargain basement Dollar Tree version of that approach because they didn't have they didn't have the free agent money and the resources would not have been well spent in the draft at the safety position. So they did it late in the draft in an undrafted free agency. And then again, on sort of the bargain bin shopping heap with guys like Tervarius Moore and Jonathan Owens. Tavarius Moore doesn't make the roster partially due to injury. I don't think he ever got picked up anywhere. I still don't think he's on a roster right now. Uh, Jonathan Owens had an okay season. Rudy Ford banged up, didn't quite have the season. He had a season to go. Savage was up and down once again. And this is clearly, obviously, everyone knows it, the biggest need on the entire team. And I don't think Brian Gutekinds is going to go quietly into the night. Expect aggressive moves at this position. If there is a huge splash free agent signing at a position, I expect it to be at safety. But I'm saying, again, bold prediction here, four brand new safeties via both free agency and the draft to completely remake that safety room. Don't be surprised either. Don't be surprised if that nickel corner position is also potentially addressed by a player who could be a safety slash corner who maybe could fill in that role as well. 
whether it be maybe a Buda Baker, maybe a Chauncey Gardner Johnson, somebody like that could play a little bit of that role. Who knows? The world is your oyster. They actually used Jeremy Chin a little bit in that role for a couple games last year. Didn't go great, spoiler alert. But there are some players that they could potentially look at that could play a little bit in that role. And then maybe uh, like on early downs, like in some of those situations, maybe use a, a bigger safety in that role. And then on later downs, maybe put Jair in the slot with, you know, Carrington Valentine and Eric Stokes, or maybe a different rookie or whoever they end up getting as an outside corner as your primary corners and obvious passing downs. But again, bold prediction here, four brand new safeties via free agency in the draft. Number two, bold prediction tags really, really well with number one. And my number two bold prediction is that Jordan Fuller will be one of those free agent signings, and he will be one of those four safeties that is added to the roster. He just makes so much sense. I believe he is a perfect scheme fit. Even take away the fact that he played with Jeff Halfley when Jeff Halfley was the defensive coordinator at Ohio State, and he knows a little bit of this defense. He knows a little bit of the system. He's worked with Halfley in the past. Even away from that, if you're just looking at him you know, on his own as a safety, as a player, I think he fits this defense perfectly. And then you add on the fact that he does have that connection with Halfley and it makes even more sense. I think he can be your primary, you know, uh, post safety, but I also think he can be a box safety. I think you can use him interchangeable in a variety of different ways. For those of you who didn't get the safety episode on Friday, I'll just kind of run down some of the numbers here. 6'2", 203, 25 years old, will turn 26 this March. Sixth round pick in 2020, had a 5.50 relative athletic score coming out of college. His projected contract, and I think it ends up probably more than this, but was two years, 9.25 million. My guess is it's probably two years, 10, two years, 12, somewhere in that range. PFF grades the past three seasons, 66.7, 60.5, 74.3. In 2023, he had 94 tackles, no sacks, three picks, eight passes defensed, three forced fumbles, no fumble recoveries. In coverage, when targeted, quarterbacks went 25 of 45, 55.6%, 334 yards, three touchdowns, three picks, and a 73.8 rating, had 10 missed tackles for a 9.9% missed tackle percentage, and played the predominant amount of safety as a free safety, 692 snaps, but did play in the box and did play in the slot a little bit as well. I loved his blend of size and range and speed and physicality. I think he should be a top priority for the Packers. He is a team captain, I think two of the past three years for the Rams, and he would be a significant upgrade at that position without having to break the bank. This is not an exorbitant free agent signing. This is one that you can get. I'm not saying necessarily on the cheap here. We're not talking about a vet minimum guy. We are talking about a substantial signing, but not one on the high end like a Xavier McKinney, where again, you're breaking the bank for someone like this. So number two, Jordan Fuller will be a Green Bay Packer, and he will be one of those four new safeties and uh, really helping the new back end of this Jeff Halfley defense. Number three on my list, there will only be four Green Bay Packers that are currently unrestricted free agents that will re-sign back with the team. Any guesses on who those four are? Here are my four that will re-sign with the Green Bay Packers. Number one, everyone's favorite, Christian Welch. Christian Welch, back of the roster, special teams player, younger inside off-ball linebacker. We've already heard Brian Gudikins talk about the fact that they are going to have to add more bodies to that room. They have precious few bodies in that room right now. Having somebody that's played in Green Bay, I know it's going to be a new system, but has that special teams experience with Rich Passaccia system and a guy who probably just gets a one-year vet minimum deal anyway. I expect Christian Welch to be brought back, not necessarily as a core 53-man roster guy, but somebody that gets added to the 90-man roster and has the opportunity to earn one of those 53-man spots in training camp. My second guy that gets re-signed back, Corey Ballantyne. Corey Ballantyne, another player that if he is your sixth corner, fifth corner, you feel awesome. He can be a core special teams guy. He can fill in in a pinch on the outside. He did a great job filling in. The, like the, the expectations for Corey Ballantyne going into the season, he was on the practice squad. And the goal going in was, hey, if we need to bring him up to the active roster to be a core special teams guy and then go in in case of emergency, we feel okay about that. We feel really good about the special teams, but we feel okay if he's a in case of emergency sort of guy, but not even making the 53, just a practice squad guy. And he goes on to start multiple games in which Green Bay won as a starting corner, didn't even get to do a lot of the special team stuff because he was actually playing as a starter on defense. 
I'm not saying that he is a starting caliber corner. I don't believe that to be the case, but he clearly proved and showed that if you need to win games with Corey Ballantyne as a starting corner, you can do it. And again, if he's your fifth or sixth guy, that's a really good spot to be in where he can be a dedicated special teams player and still a guy that can come in and give you snaps at corner without you having to change your game plan or be super worried that he's just going to get nuked on the outside. That's not what's going to happen. We saw it. We saw the proof last year. And at the same time, I don't see him being a player who gets a huge contract this offseason or that some team is going to go out and spend free agent money on to be a legitimate starter. I think he probably gets a pretty minimal deal in free agency, probably a one-year deal again. And I think Green Bay is going to be the team that probably brings him back. I don't think it's going to be a vet minimum, probably slightly above that with some bonus money in there. But I think Green Bay tries to get him back as well. Notice this the trend here. It is special teams players. Number three on my list, Tyler Davis. I actually think, as I've mentioned a couple times in the past couple weeks, that he fits in really nice as a number four tight end in Green Bay. He's an okay blocker. He's an okay run after the catch guy. He is not somebody that's going to have to play a ton of offense because you have dedicated players there in Tucker Craft and Luke Musgrave and even Ben Sims. But if either of those guys goes down, especially uh, Craft or Musgrave, because you need somebody who can come in and maybe give you a little bit of receiving ability, I think Tyler Davis can do that. And then at the again, he can play special teams. He was the the single core special teams guy two years ago. Played more snaps on special teams than anyone else. Everyone in that organization echoed how big of a loss that was on teams as soon as he went down for the season. And this is not somebody that's going to have a huge, like there's not going to be a huge appetite for Tyler Davis in free agency. He's going to have more, uh, I, I think, um, value in Green Bay than anywhere else. And again, probably a vet minimum guy who can be a core special teamer. Awesome. That, that fits perfect. And again, probably somebody that just has to earn their job in training camp, but I think he would based on his special teams ability in and of itself. So he's number three. Number four, Keyshawn Nixon. I do think Keyshawn Nixon does get re-signed. I don't feel as like certain about this one. I do think he is going to have value on the open market. He just started the entire season in the slot. He did not miss a single game. He is a first-team All-Pro kick returner the past two seasons. This is not a player that you're going to get on the super cheap. But I think probably a similar contract to what he received a season ago, a one-year $5 million deal, maybe a little bit less, maybe slightly more, but probably in that range. Green Bay's negotiated with him in the past. Nixon has that connection with Rich Passaccia. I think Rich Passaccia will go to bat and say, hey, I really want this guy back. He is sort of a culture setter on that special teams as well. He does bring a lot of that energy, both on defense and on teams. And this is another player where if he gets in as like your fifth or sixth corner, you're in a great spot. I don't think you want to bring him back and give him a contract that's going to make him a starting slot corner again, but I do think he provides valuable depth, great special teams value, you know, maybe the best kick returner, arguably the best kick returner in football, and maybe a bit of a gadget guy if you need him to be that as well. So the four players, number three on my bold prediction, the, the four players that they re-sign of all their unrestricted free agents, Christian Welch, Corey Ballantyne, Tyler Davis, and Keyshawn Nixon. And I guess in that same bold prediction is that everyone else that's a free agent, Yash Nyman, John Runyon Jr., anyone else that you want to go over, they will all, Darnell Savage, Jonathan Owens, Rudy Ford, so on and so forth, they will all leave via free agency, AJ Dillon, et cetera. So they will all leave via free agency and Welch, Ballantyne, Davis, and Nixon will be the only ones brought back. Number four, bold prediction four. Green Bay will redo the 2017 running back draft that they had that season. If you remember, 2017 running back draft was Jamal Williams in round four, Aaron Jones in round five, Devontae Mays in round seven. And I've talked about this a little bit in the past as well, but I think Green Bay is going to redo that. They have Jones as their number one running back. They've got Emmanuel Wilson as a guy who will have to battle in camp for a spot. And then I think they are going to look to add youth, speed, and athleticism to this team at the running back position. Once again, we know that Brian Gutekinds likes to buy in bulk, especially at a position like running back where you can find some of these guys late. And just like in that draft, what did they find? Jamal Williams, who they picked in the fourth, was not the best running back of that group. It was Aaron Jones in round five. Who cares? Just get one of them that's really good. They got their really good one in round five in Aaron Jones. They got Jamal Williams, a really well-rounded all-around back in round four. And Devontae Mays just ended up not doing anything, being a complete bust, basically. Sign me up. Sign me up for three running back picks with one of them being a hit, one of them being a really solid player, and one of them being a bust. I am totally cool with that if that's what they end up with. And I think he's going to repeat the 2017 version of that. 
And I think they're going to go and get three running backs in this draft. Maybe it's not fourth, fifth, and seventh. Maybe it's third, sixth, and seventh. Maybe it's third, fifth, and a priority undrafted free agent. That's maybe cheating a little bit. But whatever it might be, I think they're going to add three legitimate rookie running backs to this roster, primarily via the draft. Number five, Green Bay's first overall selection in the 2024 NFL draft will be an offensive lineman. Now, maybe that's cheating a little bit and not giving a specific name. If I were really being bold, I would say it's going to be you know, Jackson Powers Johnson or you know, whomever, but I am going to say it's an offensive lineman. If you look at where the draft sort of is strongest around where Green Bay is picking and what their potential needs are and what they like to do, I think you can kind of jump to the conclusion rather easily that offensive line makes the most sense. You might argue, understandably so, that Andy, even if like Bakhtiari and Runyon and Yash Nyman are gone, they still have Rashid Walker, Elton Jenkins, Josh Myers, Sean Ryan, Zach Tom. They have five starters on the offensive line right now that they can start and feel pretty decent about going into next season. Why are they spending their top overall pick on the offense when it's the defense that needs all this work? The reason being is one, you have no depth anymore on that offensive line if all those guys are gone. If Bakhtiari, Nyman, and Runyon are gone, your depth is gone. It's Luke Tenuta, Caleb Jones. That's about it. That is now your new depth. You are one play away from Luke Tenuta and Caleb Jones need to be your next guy up on the offensive line. Needless to say, that changes everything. And imagine if it goes from Zach Tom to Caleb Jones. And, you know, or Elton Jenkins goes out and now Zach Tom has to move to left guard and Caleb Jones or Luke Tenuta take over at right tackle. You want, number one, to start building that depth back up. Number two, you want competition. I want competition. I love Rasheed Walker and I want competition for Rasheed Walker. I would absolutely love competition for Josh Myers. I would love somebody to take that job, quite frankly. I would love not only competition, but somebody to take potentially the job and be better than Sean Ryan. I think Sean Ryan is given a little too much value for who he is at this point in time. He gave up a lot of easy pressures quick and early in games. And at, by the end of the season, John Runyon Jr. was just completely outplaying him once again, in my opinion. I don't think that that is a set it and forget it. Sean Ryan's good to go at right guard and you can just be really comfortable with where he's at as a player. Don't see that at all. So I, I believe you've got a solid left tackle in Rashid Walker, a really good left guard, a really good right tackle and two replacement level starters at Myers and uh, Sean Ryan at center and right guard and no real depth behind them and not certainly not proven depth. And I've said over and over, you are at the point already that if you have Jordan Love as your starting quarterback with the way he played last year, with all of these weapons at running back, wide receiver, tight end, they are going to be dynamic on offense, a potential 30 point a game offense. I'm not saying every single game, but they have the ability to put up over 30 every single game. All they need is the protection up front. That's not just going to come inherently. We know how many injuries that you get at that position, and it is going to be paramount that they continue to build that offensive line with depth and talent and competition. We saw how much that competition really helped them uh, a season ago, and I expect that to be something that they can continue to lean on again if they go out in the draft and really make sure that they are getting players that are going to be super helpful and able to actually compete with guys like a Josh Myers and a Sean Ryan or a Rasheed Walker at some of those positions. So if you look at, again, strength of the draft at that point in time, a potential need, especially from a depth and competition standpoint, and um, you know, just looking at some of the other things, right? I don't think it's going to be a receiver. It's certainly not going to be a quarterback or a running back at that point. I don't think they're going to go tight end with Musgrave and, and Kraft already in hand. On the defensive line, they could go there, but I don't think there's a perfect match for uh, a lineman that would fit perfectly in their system and somebody that they would draft at that 25-ish range. I would argue that they could draft an edge rusher. I would argue they could draft a corner, but I think the corner depth is going to be good enough that they can address that later. I don't think there's a safety ready to be drafted yet at that point. So I kind of get to probably edge is in that conversation, probably corners in the conversation, but I'm going to lean towards offensive line. My bold prediction here is that the Packers will take an offensive lineman with the first pick, they, with their first pick in the 2024 NFL draft. Number six, Jordan Love will receive a contract that pays him $50 million per season with a bit of an asterisk here. 
In my salary cap episode, I went over this one as well, but I think you will get a five-year, $250 million extension. However, that will put on top of his 2024 contract that he already has for this season. So when his agent announces what the deal is, it will look like a five-year, $250 million extension, which it is. But for Green Bay, because he's already under contract this season, it will look more like a six-year, 265-year contract because they get to keep him on his low-number contract this season. So both sides will be able to sort of spin it the way that they want. You know, the agent will be able to say 50 mil per year and Green Bay will say, actually, because we got him this year too, it's not really that way. But I think what it will be announced as and what it'll look like and ultimately what it will be in the five years from 2025 to what, 2029? Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, They will actually uh, be five years, 50 million. I think that will go up exponential, or like, you know, 10 million every single year. So there are going to be ways to spread that out. And by the time it gets to the end of that, they're going to do a ton of restructures on it again, but it'll be announced as a five year, $250 million extension for Jordan Love and deservedly so. Uh, certainly the way that he played last year earned him every ounce of that contract. Number seven, Speaking of quarterback and speaking of, I don't know, we speak about wide receiver. I guess we didn't. We talked about them not really adding one in round one, but let's talk about this. The Packers will draft a quarterback and a wide receiver early on day three of the draft. So in that round four, round five range, the Packers will draft a wide receiver and a quarterback. And why that's maybe a bold prediction is, well, right now at quarterback, they have two guys already. They've got Jordan Love and they got Sean Clifford. They don't need a quarterback. They could go with a yeah, Alex Magoo or somebody, an undrafted guy that can be the developmental guy in the practice squad. But I think as Brian Gudikins mentioned that he wants to get back to drafting quarterbacks. I think this is a really good developmental quarterback class. And I think they will add somebody early on day four of this draft. And then wide receiver, the reason that this is sort of bold is you can make the argument that by actually drafting a wide receiver, it means that you probably need to release a wide receiver that's a pretty good player already. You already have Romeo Dobbs, Christian Watson, Jaden Reed, Dontavian Wicks, Bo Melton, Malik Heath. You've got six guys already. Are you going to keep seven? That doesn't even include Samore Toure. That doesn't even include Grant DuBose. You don't need any more wide receivers on this roster. And you can also make the argument that, hey, once you get past like the top guys, like if you draft a guy in like the fourth or fifth or sixth round, like, are they really like, are they going to be that much better than a, you know, uh, even a Grant Dubose or a Samore Toure or some of the guys that are right now seventh and eighth on the roster? Are they going to be better than Malik Keith, the guy that's sixth on the roster? If not, you might be drafting a player early in the draft just to potentially have to either like forcibly keep a seventh guy or release them. If you don't, if they can't beat out the six or seven guys that are already on the roster, but The reason I think they will go in that direction is one, this wide receiver class is fantastic. It's very, very deep. There's a ton of talented players. And I just don't think Brian Gudikins will be able to help himself. There is going to be one of those rounds, fourth, fifth, sixth round, that there's going to be the best player available is is just inherently going to be a wide receiver. And he's going to probably fall in love with one of those guys. And Green Bay does a phenomenal job drafting wide receivers. So they're just going to do it and they're, they'll figure out the rest later. And usually what happens is you've got some injuries, guys go on IR, guys go on the pup list, whatever it might be. And you end up, you know, needing all of those guys anyway. So I think Green Bay early day three of the draft will select not only a quarterback, but a wide receiver as well. Number eight, this one's probably not so bold. This is probably all expected at this point, but the Packers will release Devondre Campbell, Royce Newman, and David Bakhtiari all prior to the start of the new league year, so within the next couple of weeks. So before we get to free agency, the start of the uh, actual free agency period, the Green Bay Packers will release Bakhtiari, Newman, and Campbell. I can't necessarily guarantee any of those individually. Reason being, Devondre Campbell's contract is interesting, and we know they need more off-ball linebackers, and they have the Packers have not shown a propensity to release players with this much dead cap hit, I mean, obviously the the Rodgers trade situation was a little bit different, but they don't like doing that very often. I don't think it's a complete guarantee that Devondre Campbell is released. I think it's likely. I think it will happen, obviously, since it's in my bold predictions here, but I wouldn't like 100% lead pipe lock it at this point. Royce Newman, I do think happens because his contract bumps up and by releasing him, they save a decent amount of money. He's also just not been good at, you know, offensive line play for the last couple of years. 
And I think they ultimately make that move, but there is a chance that they just wait a little bit longer. Maybe it doesn't get done before the league year, but I think they're going to want that free agent money to spend. And they've clearly been looking at every free agent dollar they can get. So I think Royce Newman will be another player that does get released before the league year. And then Bakhtiari, we've gone over in a million different episodes, the complexity of this situation. I do still think it's within the realm of possibility that they figure out a contract that is, you know, a compromise for both sides where Bakhtiari takes a tremendous, you know, um, you know, basically a pay cut on his, his actual base salary, but maybe get some like legitimate incentives baked into that deal. I think there is a way to get that done, but my prediction here is Campbell, Newman, and Bakhtiari all released before the start of the new league year. Number nine, Brian Gutekunst will make at least three trades during the 2024 NFL draft. I don't expect it to be for veteran players. I know he's sort of like hint, hint, nudge, nudge. We're going to look to trade some picks. I don't think that's going to be the case. And even if it is, my guess is that will happen before the draft. But I do think loaded with five top 100 picks and 11 picks likely overall, I do think he's going to maneuver his way all throughout that draft and would expect at minimum three trades during the course of that draft with which a lot of ammunition, five top 100 picks, a lot of trades should make for a very fun draft weekend in late April. Number 10, this is a tough one, but I'm going to say the Green Bay Packers will open the season on the road in LA on Monday night football against the Rams. Sean McVay versus Matt LaFleur. These are pretty darn good games every single time they match up. Green Bay usually opens up on the road. The Rams usually open up. Either the Rams or Chargers are usually like the Monday night football game. Sometimes they do the double header with one of them being later. I think Green Bay will be the last regular season game of week one on the road, the later game against the Rams. And that should be potentially a very fun matchup if that happens. That's a tougher one to predict, but that's the one I'm going to stick with. Packers, Rams, Monday night football, week one, which would be a very good game uh, to start the season. Number 11, Bo Melton will not be the only Melton on the Packers this upcoming season. Green Bay will draft his brother, Max Melton, in all likelihood on day two of the draft. He fits all of their like athletic profiles. He is a very talented player. He obviously had, the, they can gain some, you know, you know, uh, intel by knowing Bo Melton and talking to him. Could be a great uh, brother combo. I think they're clearly very pleased with what Bo Melton's been able to do. And I think Max Melton could find himself. It's a position of need. They're going to have two day two picks, uh, which again is probably where he ends up getting selected. I like, sorry, four day two picks. What am I talking about? Two round two picks, two round three picks. Probably gets pegged in that in that range. They have four of those picks. I'm going to say Max Melton, Bo Melton's brother, ends up a member of the Green Bay Packers. And number 12, last but not least, on a weekend where there's been a ton of talk and a ton of discussion about Aaron Jones, not only... Not only will Aaron Jones stay on the roster, I think they actually add a legitimate year to his contract and he will be set up to be a Green Bay Packer, not just in 2024, but in 2025 as well, that this will actually end up in a contract extension, not a release, not a trade, not anything else, but a actual, and they'll save some money and he'll probably take a pay cut in 2024, but I think he'll actually get some guaranteed money in 2025 so that Aaron Jones will remain a Packer for not just this year, but next year as well. My 12 bold predictions in conclusion for this offseason. Number one, four new safeties via free agency in the draft. Number two, Jordan Fuller will be one of those safeties. Number three, Christian Welch, Corey Ballantyne, Tyler Davis, and Keyshawn Nixon will be the only uh, un uh, unrestricted free agents that they retain. All other unrestricted free agents will be gone. Number four, Green Bay will redo the running back draft of 2017, where they took three running backs in that draft. Number five, Green Bay's first pick in the first round will be a offensive lineman. Number six, Jordan Love will get a five-year, $250 million contract extension. Number seven, the Packers will take a wide receiver and quarterback early on day three of the draft. Uh, number eight, Devondre Campbell, Royce Newman, and David Bakhtiari all released. Number nine, Brian Gutekinds will make at least three trades during the NFL draft. Number 10, Green Bay will open the season on the road against the Rams on Monday Night Football. Number 11, the Packers will draft Bo Melton's brother, Max Melton. And number 12, Aaron Jones will get a contract extension and remain a member of the Green Bay Packers. That is going to do it for me today. Thank you so much for joining me. Let me know what you think of those predictions below. Happy and excited to see your comments. 
Shout out to our Hall of Fame and All-Pro members, Most Aid in Minnesota, and PJ Wynn, John Wild, Jay Bradad, Brandon Paletta, Jennifer Wright, Boom Handle, Donna Lee, Lori Lord, Baby QB, David McCluskey, Donald Decker, and Bremen. I will see you guys soon, but until next time, and as always, Go Pack Go!